let's do it. Hello and welcome back to Niche Tea where we talk about drama happening in communities you may not be a part of. Last time we talked about drama in the history community where basically a YouTuber named James Somerton was functionally hit by the hammer of dawn. Today we're going to talk about the commentary slash anti-MLM community and do a high level recap of what has happened to date in the ongoing situation around creator Illuminati. Now before we start, Miss Illuminati is known to be quite litigious, so everything I am about to cover are allegations which have come out against Illuminati as I have seen them. It is my summary understanding of the situation. Everything is alleged, nothing has been proven that I'm aware of. If I get a cease and desist, I swear to God. And again, just because there is so much, I'm going to cover as much as I can at a very high level, and then I will direct you at the end to where to go to get more details, should you wish to learn more. Starting at the top, who is Illuminati? Illuminati, aka Blair, is a YouTube video essayist whose content, I would say, broadly has been predominantly focused on like bad business practices. It used to be more specifically anti-MLM, but it's expanded since then to be more about like any bad company or bad charity, etc. But then more recently, because she uploads so frequently, the topics are a lot more broad. I guess it's like commentary slash investigation at this point. Up until now, it's been pretty successful. I literally took a break so I could think about how I wanna talk about the actual bullshit that goes down. All of this starts because Blair goes on Twitter one day accusing another YouTube account, Legal Eagle, of copying her. Specifically copying what seemed to be universally used and easily available like editing techniques. And this particular act of fucking around has led to three different lanes of finding out she will then experience. The first and hilariously least interesting of these is everyone coming back and being like, yeah, we all use those. Those are free, you don't own those. And Legal Eagle actually responded to her and was like, not only that, um, we used it before you. So that was a quick and dirty L for Blair there. But then also we get find out number two happening, which was H Bomber guy replying to Blair's tweet saying, hey Vestie, you're actually the one that steals things. This was where he first showed the evidence that Blair plagiarized to her anti-vax video, which he would then further investigate across her other videos, all culminating in the very large video we talked about in the last episode. So that's L number two. And then this also instigated find out lane number three to kick off, which was Sad Milk. Sad Milk was a collaboration YouTube channel that existed for a period of time between Blair herself, as well as a number of other YouTubers. The people from Sad Milk we're gonna talk about today are specifically named one topic, The Click, Wonderstruck, and Oz Media. Sad Milk had ended a little bit before this. However, I guess with the legal eagle stuff popping off and people giving Blair more scrutiny at the time, one topic was like, fuck it, we ball, and posted a very intense and long Twitter thread detailing all the mistreatment that apparently he and the other Sad Milk members suffered at Blair's hands, allegedly. This of course being very ironic given that Blair's main channel, Illuminati, focuses very heavily on company mismanagement and employee mistreatment. And quickly after one topic came out, so did the other three. And when I tell you these guys have details and receipts at a very, very high level, they outlined that Blair was very manipulative, very controlling. They alleged that she was just very mean. She had very bad temper. She had overwhelmingly more clout, power, followers, all that stuff, but also more money than them. And she used this very intentionally to her advantage. She was emotionally manipulative to them. She would create infighting. She would use her following and like vague tweeting and doing stuff and use like alt accounts and drop stuff about other people and share secrets. Very Colleen Ballinger, very uh, creep show art, just like, just a lot of that. Overall, very, very toxic. And according to these four, the reason that Sad Milk ended up falling apart. She was also allegedly financially very controlling over them to whatever extent she could be. This includes not getting paid on the cadence that was expected or the amounts that were expected, but also she would convince them that it made more sense instead of them getting their own car or moving in with someone else. She's like, no, I'll buy a car and you can lease it from me, or I'll buy a house and you can stay with me. I'm gonna buy another house so you can just stay there. Creating situations such that she controlled almost every aspect of their life. This is what I meant when I said the company town thing. For me though, the biggest thing is the weaponizing of personal trauma that is alleged against her. And I know I brought up the weaponizing the unalive note thing and people called out that that wasn't her partner because you're thinking of Wonderstruck. I actually wasn't thinking of Wonderstruck. I got them confused. She's done it twice, allegedly. One of the four members of Sad Milk, Oz Media, was previously her partner. At some point before that, there was another guy named Azafan. 
YouTuber Swoop made a documentary. She spoke to Azothan about this, and he said to her that at some point they had an argument and Blair called him like mediocre and that she was above him or above the situation or something, and that he claims that was directly referencing an unalive note that he had made in the past, referring to himself as mediocre and a burden. And then separately from that, in a video that Blair made, she made one large video in response to all the tweets from the Sad Milk guys, which was those tweets were in response to all the Legal Eagle stuff happening, so that's now we're at a video that Blair made in response to that, which was largely regarded to be absolute trash because she basically just tries to find any personal issue with any person that anything they've ever done wrong in their whole life and weaponize it against them without really addressing like the specific things as much. And also she just doesn't really seem to have a leg to stand on in my opinion. But in that she tries to weaponize Wonderstruck's mental health against him, including I believe weaponizing his unalive note in that video. Then in response to Blair's video, one topic, Wonderstruck and Now Oz Media have all put out very in-depth, well-structured, articulate videos with a lot of screenshots showing everything they possibly can about what they've had to deal with dealing with Blair. And then Oz claims in his video another instance of Blair weaponizing trauma against them, specifically that he and Blair, who were partners at the time, had some sort of situation where she gave him money for something that he needed and then she came to him later and said that she took the money illegally out of her business when she shouldn't have and just didn't tell him at the time and because of that she had committed embezzlement. And she used that to manipulate him because he in his past had had his mother sent to prison for embezzlement and it deeply traumatized him. I have not even scratched the surface of the details of this and look at the timestamp we're at. Since the Sad Milk's response videos came out, I think all of them have been sent cease and desist and a few other people, again, she's very litigious and she has not commented on it further that I'm aware of. She has also turned off comments on all of her videos and is trying to just keep going with her life. She's posted like somebody said 60 videos since all this went down. Definitely go watch each of the individual guys' videos. Go read their Twitter threads if you like and go watch the Swoop documentary and that should get you in the right content spiral to get all the details. Hello and welcome back to Niche Tea where we talk about drama happening in communities you may not be a part of. Last time we talked about the ongoing fallout YouTuber Illuminati has been facing from a misguided tweet allegation she made against Legal Eagle. Today we're gonna talk about a situation that's been unfolding for the last couple of weeks in the gaming community. I I say situation because this really goes beyond tea drama. At best, this is really sad and disappointing. Um, and at worst, this has legal implications. As always, we'll cover background first. The gaming community predominantly existing on YouTube is the collection of YouTubers who do pretty much any content related to games. This can be Let's Plays, this can be speed runs, gaming reviews, gaming commentary, anything along those lines. It's a very large community with a lot of really big players. For example, PewDiePie is part of the gaming community, so is Markiplier. The situation we'll be talking about today centers on a creator named The Completionist, also known as Gerard. He is a gaming YouTuber, predominantly known for his gaming reviews, and he is been very wholesome, loved, unproblematic up until this point that I'm aware of. The two other primary players in this are also gaming YouTubers. The first is named Mudahar. He's also known as Some Ordinary Gamers on YouTube. And the other is named Carl Jobst, and he, I believe, is a speedrunner. So what happened? Several weeks back, Carl and Mudahar both posted videos on their respective channels talking about an investigation that they did together into a charity organization run by the completionist called Open Hands. The background on that is that the completionist Gerard, his mother was diagnosed with a form of dementia when he was very young. She battled it and lost her life to it as he was growing up over a period of like 15 years. But this is a cause that is very close and dear to him and his family. And he wanted to be able, as he got bigger on YouTube, to do something to support research in the dementia field. His family created the Open Hands organization as a way to gather funds through charity events, which they would then partner with different dementia research organizations to donate the funds to. One of the primary sources of donations that Open Hands gets every year come from a charity event that Gerard the Completionist host called Indie Land. This is a, I believe, several day event where indie games are highlighted and played. It gives good exposure to these indie developers who it can be very hard for them to get funding, et cetera, and get traction. But also then all of the money, everything from sponsors, donated money, you can donate like bits on Twitch, like literally anything, it's supposed to go into Open Hands. And he says this repeatedly. He also repeatedly talks about the organizations that Open Hands works with. He names a number of different organizations. And he does this consistently every time he talks about Open Hands, not just for Indie Land, 
Generally, in Carl and Mudahar's videos, they both go through the fact that they investigated the tax returns for open hand, which are publicly available. And basically what they can see through that is that none of the money had actually been donated. It's not that anything had been taken out, at least not from Indyland that they can see. There's no allegation that Indyland money was being pocketed. However, they say it's just been sitting there and open hands has been active for years, like a decade. So this money never actually got to the organizations that everyone thought it was getting to and that more importantly, Gerard was making a point to say it was going to. Now, Gerard's family manages the organization. He claims in a call that Mudahar and Carl had with him that he did not know that the money was sitting there and hadn't actually been donated until 2022. However, Indyland 2023 continued as expected and he continued to say, we're working with these organizations and very much implying that the money had gone, is going, will go to these organizations, it hasn't. And that potentially constitutes fraud. Now, Gerard had reasons related to like high fees and wanting to make sure they restricted the money to be used in certain ways for why this money hadn't been moved yet and that they were still talking to different people. However, again, it has been a decade. So beyond even the fact that what Gerard was telling people was not the truth of what was happening and the fact that that could constitute charity fraud, 10 years is a huge amount of time where research has not been done using money that was intended for that research. And because of inflation, the money is literally worth less now than it was when it was initially donated. So Mudahar and Carl put out their videos. The completionist took a good amount of time to respond and the response was not super well received. For me personally, he's way too focused on this idea that he was never intending to steal the money. But nobody said that, not about Indyland anyway. And he clearly just doesn't think it's that big of a deal. He thinks it's okay that it's been this long because because he was gonna give the money in the end anyway and he just wanted to make sure they were making the right decision. And in that video where it sounds to me like he's trying to excuse why this money hasn't gone anywhere, he's talking to the people whose money he took and it just, it doesn't, it doesn't come off well in my opinion. The video was rough for me. He sounded very defensive, very angry, he spent a good amount of time talking about the hate he's getting and how inappropriate that is. Don't talk about that in your apology or acknowledgement videos. Don't do that. Address it separately. This video is meant to be toward the people whom you have theoretically wronged. Don't bring it back to you and how you've been wronged. Make a separate post. He also spoke about some potential legal action, assumedly against Mudahar and Carl. I don't believe anything specifically has come of that. Now, I want to say since that video came out, Mudahar and Carl continued to investigate and make new videos with new things that they found. And a bigger thing had come out regarding another event which advertised itself as supporting the Open Hands Foundation. And that is a golf tournament, I believe managed by Gerard's father. The problem there is that in going through the IRS filings, Mudahar and Carl allege that they cannot tie any of the revenue from the golf tournaments to anything actually donated to open hands. They're basically saying open hands didn't get this money. So this money is unaccounted for at least to some extent. I haven't heard anything additional yet regarding the golf tournament. However, since Mudahar and Carl's videos have come out, um, $600,000 has been donated by the Open Hands Foundation. So that money is now in the hands of the actual researchers. Gerard has said that he is stepping down from the board of the Open Hands Foundation, but it is managed by his family. That's also another thing that's been brought up is that potentially some of the reasons that Gerard's responses have been so confusing and not what we would expect from him is because he may be covering for his family. Gerard has also said he wants to continue to move forward with IndieLand in 2024 because it does benefit the actual indie game designers, but that there will not be a charity component associated and he will no longer associate with open hands. As far as fallout goes, Gerard's subscriber count has been going down as you would probably expect. He's also been removed. He had a cameo in the new Sea of Stars game that is being patched out. It's a really cute game, by the way, if you like um, Chrono Trigger, play it. <laughs> The completionist subreddit is also private now for some reason. I don't know. Definitely go check out Mudahar and Carl's videos. They have videos covering this as it continues, including updated details. I'll put the visuals of the first ones here for you to reference. Fingers crossed the golf tournament money shows up.
You got it. Hello and welcome back to Niche Tea, where we talk about drama happening in communities you may not be a part of. Last time we talked about the really unfortunate charity debacle going on with the completionist in the gaming community. Today we're gonna go really niche and talk about some developments in competitive Splatoon. Splatoon is a team-based competitive game made by Nintendo. You've probably seen it before, or at least visuals from it. The goal of the game is you and your teammates enter an arena against another team you have an assigned color, the other team has an assigned color. All of your weapons are based around paint. You are splattering paint everywhere around the arena with the goal of getting as much of the arena covered in your color of paint as possible by the end, which I believe determines the winner. There's other mechanics involved, but this is all that really matters for what we're gonna talk about today. Now, because it is paint-based, the colors that you're assigned are really, really bright. So you're able to differentiate between your color and your opponents. It's also just the aesthetic of the game. Now the game itself has gone through a bunch of different iterations. They're on Splatoon 3 right now, and it gets continually updated by the Nintendo team to add more dynamics to the game. This includes new weapons, new maps, etc. There are also what are called special weapons. My understanding is special weapons can be thought of as like charge moves. So the whole situation we're about to talk about kicked off because several weeks back, Nintendo released a new special weapon called the Splatter Color Screen. The way this works is when you activate it, a big screen comes out in front of you and moves forward into your opponents. And if they get hit by it, it has effects on them for a number of seconds. There are two primary effects that happen to you, the player, if you get hit with someone else's splatter color screen. The first is that the colors are muted, so you can no longer as easily distinguish between your own paint color and a competitive paint color. And the other is that this like kind of noise plays on top of everything. The goal of it is to be disorienting. And when you describe it the way I just did, it sounds like it's probably fine and it does what it's intended to do. However, the problem has arisen that when people use it in game because of the specific combination of things that it does and the way it alters the color, it's actually causing a lot of actual health problems for people. <laughs> there have been all kinds of reports from the most common being like people getting migraines from this to also dizziness and nausea. There have been claims of epilepsy being triggered by this, but also vision impairment because the way it's grayscaling the color, it's bringing down the saturation, but it's not affecting the value of the color. And so it just makes it incredibly bright. And the combination of the enhanced brightness alongside this weird like staticky sound that they chose with the the intention of being disorienting is so disorienting that it's disproportionately affecting certain players, especially those who already have audiovisual or like neurological disorders. Lots of people have come forward both with and without some type of disability saying, this has made me not able to play this game. And it's of course kicked off a ton of back and forth within the competitive Splatoon community because there are a ton of people being frankly very ableist and just kind of like saying, well, it doesn't affect me, so get over it. That is not how a game should be made. Like there is a meaningful difference between seeing bright saturated colors and bright non-saturated colors and people acting like they don't understand this concept is truly confusing to me. Like a good example of this in day-to-day -day life is when it's a really overcast day, it can still be incredibly bright. If you look up at the sky, it will hurt your eyes. Like try and take nice photographs on an overcast day, it sucks. And my understanding is this isn't a very good special weapon anyway compared to the other ones available. So like, why would anybody be riding this hard for it except to be a dick? But you know, competitive gaming. It seems a number of people have made updated demo versions of what the splatter color screen could be in a way that is more accessible. And in the meantime, it seems like a lot of competitive spaces are banning it or finding ways around it, which of course is sparking more trolling. As of the most recent patch update, that I saw come out from Nintendo, it does not look like this has been patched out yet or fixed in any way. And I haven't seen them address it at all. And I really just don't understand why. Like you're saying that people who truly love this game have put it down forever until this is removed. If it's that disruptive to even a minority of your players, remove it. I hope they do soon, cause that sucks. Ah, oh, he sure did. Hello and welcome back to Niche Tea, where we talk about drama happening in communities you may not be a part of. Today we're continuing to talk about the history community in the first follow-up video that I've made in this series yet. And I'm only really doing that in situations where there's a lot to say, and there is a lot to say. Because James Summerton, the YouTube video essayist who has been, I think at this point we can say proven to have both plagiarized and lied a significant amount in his videos over the last several years, has issued an apology video. For more in-depth detail and background, you can follow this comment back to the previous video and it goes through the whole thing. It's too much to try and summarize again here. Now, he did immediately take the video down, probably like the same day, and that is because it's very bad. 
and we're gonna talk about why at a high level. So Tipster on YouTube is a drama slash news channel, has the full video and has a video going through it so you can see the entirety of it there. I'm going to link their TikTok below and you can get to their YouTube from there. And there's one clip from Tipster's YouTube video covering this that I think fully and perfectly encompasses just the whole vibe of it. And before I play it, just take a minute, look at my username and you'll understand why this sent me into orbit. I never, ever intended to hurt anybody. I never thought that that's what I was doing. Before I went, before I went to the hospital, I, I read a lot of- It's fine, we're fine. So what made this video bad? There's another TikTok creator I'm actually going to link below as well. Her name is Molly McPherson PR. She's somebody who talks about apologies from people who are in the spotlight who have done things wrong and the way that they've addressed them. She really likes to break down how those apologies do and don't work. She's really great. I really like her content. So please go check her out if you find this to be interesting. The reason I want to bring her into this specifically, and I don't know that she's covered this, but I think about her as I look at apology videos now because there's some core do's and don'ts when it comes to these types of things. And James Summerton's video pretty much goes against any recommendation anybody would ever give. Real fast, a trigger warning for mental health slash talk of SH. Very high level, won't be descriptive, but just in case. When the video starts, it is immediately Laura Lee vibes and it stays that way the entire time. Very woe is me. And right off the bat, the first thing that he brings up is the fact that the reason he has not responded fully until now is because he's been in the hospital because he almost made a terrible mistake, obviously alluding to either SH or an attempt or both, which in conjunction with how emotional he is in this video is not the way you wanna be doing this. I've mentioned before with the Gerard thing, I think talking about the impact of your bad actions on yourself is something that you should talk about outside of any type of accountability or apology video entirely. But at the very least, opening with that is very bad form. You're setting the stage as, let's talk about me and how bad this is for me and not what I've done to you. That's one thing that Molly talks about. Another one is that you're always supposed to very directly speak about what you have done, the harm that you've caused, that you understand the impact of what you've done, and then apologize and say how you're going to fix it, how you're going to change going forward, etc. And he pretty much does none of this. He minimizes the plagiarism entirely to just like not crediting people, which would not change that. It's pretty funny actually because H Bomber guy's video he specifically talked in the Illuminati section about how just crediting doesn't change the fact that you lifted entire parts of other people's stuff and just put it in yours. That's still plagiarism. And truly the longer this video goes on the worse it gets and the less sympathy you have. I started writing down my favorite quotes because some of them were so absurd. I didn't realize I was hurting people. I never thought anyone thought I was doing journalism. I should have been more diligent about fact checking and stuff. The part that was lazy was the copy and paste part. Great, thanks James, thanks so much. He also laments for several minutes about him and Nick no longer being friends, but then proceeds to also talk about how he's definitely not throwing Nick under the bus, but simultaneously he says over and over again that he didn't write those parts. What else, what, what does that mean? But the worst part is when he talks about what he wants to do to make it right. He thanks H Bomber Guy for setting up a fund to support the creators from whom James plagiarized and says, not, I'm just gonna give money to that. Not, I'm gonna double whatever. Not, I'm gonna give all the revenue from those videos to it. No, he said, I'll make those videos where I stole stuff public again, and they'll give the future revenue to this fund H Bomber guy set up. That's, that's not, that's not how this is gonna, no. So yeah, that's why it was pulled down so fast. The comments on that immediately came for him. There was even a comment from Folding Ideas. He's another pretty big video essayist on YouTube. He's the one who made that viral uh, NFT video last year. And something else that was in Tipster's video that I didn't even realize was when this all first went down, James had a Patreon. One of the people he stole from was actually one of his Patreon supporters. Fuck. But he obviously shut that down in the middle of everything. Well, apparently he just like really quietly put it back up at some point and it was charging people who didn't realize like until it was already done. Like every shady thing a person can do, every misstep a person can make, I, he's making it. He claims he's gonna come back with a proper apology later. Just stop doing shady things. That's all we want at this point. 
There's way more detail, so go check out Tipster's video for like the full breakdown. And go check out Molly McPherson's page too. She's got really interesting breakdowns for this type of stuff from a PR standpoint. I wasn't gonna cover this because I thought she deleted her Twitter and this was over, but Miss Girl is back with a vengeance, so here we go. Hello and welcome back to Niche Tea, where we talk about drama happening in communities you may not be a part of. Last time we talked about the really unfortunate, what I'm gonna call apology attempt by James Somerton, who was recently outed for repeated and egregious plagiarism of other LGBT content creators in his YouTube YouTube video essays. Today we're going back over to book Twitter and specifically I'm starting to think of this as just author Twitter because authors seem to have a lot of beef on Twitter. Like the fact that this happened so quickly after the Kate Corain thing is insane to me. That video is in the playlist. I think it's episode nine. So again at a high level when I say book Twitter I specifically mean authors interacting with one another on Twitter. I'm not gonna say X. This all started when author Marvelous Michael Anson who goes by Marv with an E on Twitter posted about their upcoming book, Firstborn of the Sun. The post seemed to be a pretty standard promotion for upcoming work. Then another author named Lauren M. Davis comes in and comments below it saying, oh, your main character wouldn't happen to have the ability to control the sun, would she? To which Marv is like, yeah, obviously. And then Lauren says they're gonna send Marv a DM. Turns out Lauren thinks that because she wrote a book that was, I believe, released in 2020, which included a main character who could control the sun, that that is somehow now protected under copyright as her property intellectually. And basically since then, Lauren has been, I think, trying to prevent the book from coming out, but also just trying to drag Marv's name through the mud for plagiarizing. This is already so dumb and bad, but when I tell you it gets so much worse, the more you learn. As I mentioned in the beginning, at one point, Lauren does delete one of her Twitter accounts where she initially started this beef. So because of that, some of the screenshots and some of the information I got from other TikToks. So I'm gonna tag the creators below whose videos I reference. I'm also gonna show their faces and their tags, um, but you know, please go check them out and get more information there. The timeline for this after this initial kickoff within this tweet thread is pretty much that Lauren sends DMs to Marv, which I think Marv ignores. Marv kind of clowns on this whole idea as they should, frankly, because it is absurd. And this brings more attention to it, which then causes Lauren to double, triple, quadruple, quintuple down at every chance she possibly gets. Lauren explains that no, it is not just sun-based powers, but also both the characters are black and they're both named Nova. You know, that really unique name for somebody who has sun powers. On top of the absurdity of this, there are also two immediate problems that become apparent. As one creator already pointed out, and as you can easily see on Lauren's new active Twitter, her Nova is not black at all. Why are you lying? Why the fuck you lying? But also there's another stickling point that I have here that nobody's really talked about that's been really bothering me. Lauren says in her description that everyone in the kingdom of Oru is born with Agbara, the ability to draw magic from the sun. That is not the same thing as controlling the sun. Superman gets his powers from the sun. The sun makes him stronger. Solar, deep pull, actually controls the sun. Kind of nitpicky, but like that's the thing that set you off. That's what started this whole thing and it's not even the thing you're saying it is. People continue to tell Lauren that she's being absurd because she is. And at some point, for some reason, Lauren, who is a Southern white cop, by the way, decides to put this tweet out about Nigerians, which golly gosh, just so happens that Marv is Nigerian. When she is immediately called out for this, she goes on an absolute unhinged tirade, tweeting over and over again all the things she's done for the African-American community. It is insane. She also revealed that she contacted Marv's agent, assumedly to get the book stopped at this point, and I'm gonna give all the actual props in the world to Marv's agent because they came back like a boss. They quickly responded, they quickly publicly responded and addressed it and basically said, this is BS, you are full of it, leave my client alone. Imagine if K-pop agencies were this good. Now, again, I wasn't gonna cover this because I thought Lauren had deleted her Twitter and that she had just kind of run away, but no. As of today, she's still very much on Twitter, just under a different handle, and she's deleted all of the initial tweets, but she's still coming at, like, literally anybody who <laughs> says anything to her. She's, like, replying to people's tweets and being haughty and passive-aggressive and, like, double-tripling, quadrupling down yet again constantly. She will not let this go. 
Thankfully, this really doesn't seem to have affected Marv at all. They've gotten a good number of new Twitter followers. I highly recommend you go follow them. If you like fantasy, they seem to have some really cool stuff coming out. And Marv is an Amazon bestselling author. They've been really thankful for the positivity they've received throughout this whole thing because I'm sure it was really frustrating and scary to an extent. So please go give them some support and, you know, look into their books to see if there's anything you might consider adding to your reading list. Hello and welcome back to Niche Tea where we talk about drama happening in communities you may not be a part of. I hope everyone is enjoying the last days of 2023. I can tell you who is not though and that would be today's topic which is the chess community. When I tell you this community is so messy. As I've looked into what we're going to talk about today and everything else going on because there's like multiple things going on at the same time, I've come to realize that the chess community is where like apex boy drama happens. And that's not to say that there aren't tons of women in the space. It's just literally women are just trying to fight the organizations to play in the first place. Meanwhile, the boys, and by boys, I do mean anywhere up to like 50 year old men are getting into just absolute squabbles constantly. And these are grandmasters or like master players we're talking about. It's insane. Like a damn near 50 year old man got his chess.com blog privileges taken away because he was shitting on a 12 year old. Like I can't make this up. But today we're gonna talk about something that is still happening. Like my most recent updates are as of five hours ago and that is related to the 2023 championships. First, as always though, we're gonna set some foundation. So I assume most people know what chess is. I'm not gonna explain how the game works. There are obviously tons and tons of people who play chess throughout the world and there is a governing body Body of chess called FIDE, which is the acronym for the French title of the organization, but in English, it's the World Chess Federation. They oversee tournaments, rules of play, how people are ranked, stuff like that. Now, when we talk about rankings, these are determined based on a unit called ELO points. These are officially monitored and tracked by FIDE and you earn or lose points based on your performance in like FIDE recognized matches. How many points you win or lose in a match with someone else is based on how many points you had going in compared to theirs. So if theirs were much higher than yours going in and you win, you get a bigger bump in points than you would have if you went in against somebody who had the exact same ranking as you. And same thing in reverse. If that person who has a much higher rank loses to you with a much lower rank, they lose more points than they would if they played against somebody with the same rank as them or someone higher ranked than them. So in the simplest terms, theoretically, the higher your point score is, the better chess player you are. So as I mentioned in the beginning, this is about the championships for 2023, which that championship tournament will happen next year. And before that tournament, there is a championship candidates tournament that is also happening next year. And right now, everyone's fighting to get into this candidates tournament so that they can potentially win the candidates tournament to get to the actual final championships. There are eight spots open for the candidates tournament. Six of them are actually not open. They're actually filled already based on tournaments that have already happened earlier in the year. Um, and there are two spots left open. We're focusing on one of them because there's one player who is specifically gunning right now to take the last spot, which will be given to the person with the highest number of ELO points as of the end of 2023. Now this gets a little bit confusing, so I'm gonna try and simplify. I believe the person who was on top was a player named Wesley So. And it looked like Wesley was probably going to be the person to take that last candidate spot for that tournament next year. But there is another player named Alareza Faruja, who is an Iranian French champion. Faruja would obviously like to be in the championships and thus would like to be in the candidates tournament. So my understanding is, and I'm not sure exactly how this is happening, but there are jobber tournaments being set up for him so that he can inflate his score in time for the end of the year so that he can overtake Wesley So and get that last spot. This seems to be a thing that no one is contesting. Like that is what is happening. But as this has progressed, it's kicked off a lot of scrutiny. These tournaments are all masters tournaments, but there's a lot of different point differentials between the rankings, like once you get to master. Most of the guys he was going up against seem to have several hundred points below him, which means he gets fewer points from playing against them, but he's more likely to win. So the idea being like, he'll get these tiny little bumps and bumps and bumps until he overtakes Wesley. People who support Faruja bring up that, A, this has been done before. Another year previously, this was done um, to get a candidate into the tournament. And everyone kind of agreed that it was fine and B, that Wesley So can do the same thing if he'd like to. There's nothing stopping him. The counter arguments to that though have been that for the player that did it previously, they had the ranking. It was just they didn't have like a minimum number of games that had to be played very specifically, I believe due to COVID restrictions. So that was a different circumstance and it wasn't as though he was like trying to inflate his score, which is somewhat what it looks like you're doing here. And Wesley has come out himself and said like, yeah, I could do that, but I'm not gonna do that, that sucks. 
So everyone's just been watching Faruja as he goes to see if he can get the points that he needs to overtake Wesley before the end of the year. But then, literally on Christmas, Fide came out with a new set of rules that were like, if you make a tournament that's like a master's tournament, we're not gonna count it unless there's at least one player that has over a 2700 score, which I believe would discount some of the stuff that Faruja has already done, which would then put Wesley back on top. But then people are like, well, if you're gonna do that, won't you take away the guy's championship from before when he won, but you know, as a result of doing the same thing, because I don't think his made that qualification. And then they came back and clarified that, no, this is like a going forward thing. So it actually doesn't affect the stuff that Faruja has already done. So then he is still on top. But then also a few days before that, the US chess president issued this letter on behalf of the US chess organization to FIDE and the world, basically being like this French tournament, at least one of the ones that Faruja has done, shouldn't be counted at all because of, you know, the way it was set up and what its clear intentions were. Wesley so is American, so that's part of the reason. But Fide hasn't decided on that, so those points could still be taken away from him, which would put him back below Wesley So. Also, like, I'm getting the impression for at least a couple of games, he, like, did not perform the level that he needed to to get the points that he needed, and, like, these were set up for you. That's a little embarrassing. Anyway, he's still going. He's still got, I don't know, a couple days. The tea is hot. It is happening right now. Hello and welcome back to Niche Tea, where we talk about drama happening in communities you may not be a part of. Last time we talked about what I am now definitively convinced is the messiest community to ever exist, which is the chess community, and the drama surrounding the race to the candidates tournament for the 2024 championships. Today we're gonna talk about something I have had just the best time looking into, and that is a like Scientology dupe that exists in Final Fantasy XIV. That was a lot of work. So let's start from the top. Final Fantasy XIV is a massive multiplayer online role-playing game, aka an MMORPG, or an MMO more commonly called, or a Memorpaga. If you're not super familiar with MMOs, all you really need to know is it's a game where you and a bunch of other people come together into the game online and interact with each other and the game. You can go on quests together and hunt stuff together and all kinds of stuff. Popular ones you may have heard of are like Elder Scrolls, EVE Online, World of Warcraft, etc. Now I believe in all of these you can build and join clubs basically. The idea being that you guys band together in a club and then you support each other in doing really hard quests or fighting really hard bosses and stuff like that. It's fun, it builds community, it helps you meet new people, etc. These clubs are usually called guilds. In Final Fantasy XIV, they are called free companies or FCs. Now, in Final Fantasy XIV, there is a free company called Azure Infinitum, which I have come to learn is basically like, again, trying to be a Scientology dupe. And when I say that, I mean that in a very specific way. I don't mean that it has any religious implications at all. What I mean is specifically in the way that it is trying to be a cult. And trying, trying is the word. And that's what makes this so funny. <laughs> The primary person who's basically upstanding this entire thing is a character in the game named Reika Fujishima. Now Reika, the character, is the leader of Azure Infinitum in Final Fantasy XIV, but this is where it already gets confusing. I have two people who made Reika. One is a person named Erika and the other is a person named Hikaru Kazushime. Reika seems to be an OC made by Erika. However, in all of the accounts that I found about Final Fantasy XIV specifically, it looks like Hikaru is the one that's actually Reika in those instances. And so people do refer to Reika as he. So I'm going to refer to Reika as he. I hope that made sense. Of note, both Erika and Hikaru list themselves as CEO slash owners of Azure Infinitum. They're treating this like an IP, like a company. That's important for later. So Reika runs this guild, we'll call it, actively within the Final Fantasy XIV universe and actively recruits. I do wanna call out here that a massive chunk of what I'm going to show you does come from a very specific YouTube video uploaded by a user whose name is Na, and I realized that this is the only video that they've put up on their channel. <laughs> Please go watch that for more of the details. I'm gonna call out the things that I think are particularly funny, but they have so many details there. All the Discord screenshots you see here, I'm not in Discord, they're not posted anywhere. They loaded them from that video, so I'm sourcing it from there, and they have way, way more, so please go check it out. So first up, something that Na brings up in their video is that the terms of service to join Azure Infinitum are insanely long, like nearly twice as long as the actual terms of service for Final Fantasy XIV. It is insane. And I did go through them at a high level, and more than half of it seems to purely be about, like, dispute settlements. We have a no drama policy, da da da, over and over and over again. There is also some really sketchy language around like, oh, don't, you know, get mad and leave because then you'll regret it and don't listen to people. You'll be surprised how much people will say bad things about us. Like, mm, okay. Then once you get into it, the role playing is intense. Reika himself has like an entire website dedicated to lore of the character that goes across 
a bunch of different games. And my understanding is that people are expected to be like active and present and doing things with the guild in like a routine way. And specifically, ideally in ways that will add to Azure's lore, which is actively tracked. And like the way you get promotions in rank within the guild, cause there are ranks, would be by doing things that will add to guild lore. Doing things together in game is normal. That's the point of a guild. It's not that big of a deal. The lore piece is kind of weird, but it's whatever. But they've also done some, for lack of a better term, culty shit, like doing a parade through the world where the whole guild just like walked through and were spamming as free as the azure sky over and over again. But the really, really big part is just the toxicity around anybody who shows disloyalty or leaves. There are numerous accounts of people getting harassed intensely by Reka specific for leaving under any circumstance. There's a ton of very loaded terminology utilized, which is similar to what is done in cults, like calling people traitors, treasonous. Reka even made a custom term, sky fallen, for people who have left the guild, again, under any circumstance. One time a bunch of people left altogether and it has been henceforth named the Sundering. Reka will have everyone ice the people out, including people that they were friends with. They're no longer allowed to be anywhere near them. Reka will absolutely shit talk them in their discord. I've definitely seen proof that Reka themselves has violated their anti-harassment and hate speech policies in their own rules. The absolute worst thing you can do is leave and join any other guild for any other reason. This causes Reka to lose his shit. Those are the situations where Reka starts to escalate. And this includes even if you like start your own guild of just yourself because there are some benefits to doing so. Everything is immediately like a threat from the outside and the rhetoric goes insane and then Reka finds ways to escalate. But again, they want to stay in character as they do this. So like one time they and a couple of their lieutenants like walked over to another guild that they thought were like actively poaching against them. And they like stood outside of their guild headquarter doors and just kept asking to talk to them in character for like hours. Hours, allegedly? They then started mocking up cease and desist to send to the other guild leaders. And what I have on screen right now is exactly how it was delivered, by the way. Also, you see that like California code in the middle that this is referencing? I think I understand based on what I'm showing you now why Reka used that particular code. However, if you look at the macro, like what the code is talking about, it is in reference to drilling oil. I do not think that that applies. But again, it's that Scientology based approach where you treat your organization as a company and thus anybody who says anything bad about it, who does anything you don't like, they're liable for the damages you incur as a result of that, which also might include even like other people leaving. But in addition to how silly this whole thing is and the fact that someone would even try and do this, the funniest, funniest part is that no one cares. Absolutely no one takes this guy seriously. I have seen so many screenshots, again, from that YouTube video, please go watch it. Of Reka just going and going and going and saying the most insane shit and people are like, okay, bro. Like, they do not care. It is amazing. The only material harm that he is continuously causing is hurting what I assume are a lot of teenagers' feelings. I found a post on Reddit from years ago detailing like four different people's bad experiences where basically they were like, this made me really sad. Literally people who just want to play the game, make friends and have fun and you're pissing in their Cheerios. Imagine going through all that work just so you could be a run-of-the-mill MMO bully. Are you not ashamed of yourself? Are you not embarrassed? This is really embarrassing. Hello and welcome back to Niche T, where we talk about drama happening in communities you may not be a part of. Last time we talked about what you guys are telling me is potentially very common cult-like behavior from guilds in Final Fantasy XIV, specifically with the guild Azure Infinitum. Today we're going to talk about a situation which I'm going to say is in the animation community, though it covers a couple different genres. It centers on a specific creator whose name is Joe Cat. This is kind of a bummer story, so heads up, but I do think there's some good that we can do here if you can stick around. So who is Joe Cat? He is a YouTuber with 1.15 million subscribers currently, and he is an animator. His animations are usually related to role-playing games. He also does live streams, let's plays, things along those lines. I didn't actually realize that I had already watched his stuff until I went to look him up because of this. He has a series of videos that I watched a while ago called A Crap Guide to D&D &D, and they're truly great. If you have no idea what D&D &D is and you're interested in learning about it in like a not too over the top way, they're a perfect way to get into that. And even if you do, I think you'd find them really cute. You like hitting things? What am I saying? Of course you do. Everybody does. I most certainly do all the time, like now. <laughs> And hitting things is the best thing about D&D. You can hit literally anything you want. His animations are cute. His script writing and voiceovers are really, really funny. And he's a really entertaining guy. I really like his content. He's also very unproblematic. Little things here and there, but 
but nothing real that I can find. So what happened? Two weeks ago, Joe Cat went onto Twitter and posted a link to a larger in-depth statement, but basically said that the summary was that he's gonna finish up the projects he's working on now and then would be officially leaving the internet and no longer creating content. The statement itself goes into this a little bit more in depth and calls back to some flack he got for a video he made a while back. The summary of the whole thing is that after Lizzo's Boys came out, a lot of people made riffs on it, right? Different versions of the song. During a live stream he was doing, he did his own version called Girls. Obviously he had written this beforehand, but he set it up to make it look like he just did it on the fly. It was cute. He then took that audio and did an animation around it. We're talking a 30 second video. It's literally a match of that song. It's a mix of characteristics of somebody like liking big girls or itty bitty girls, but also things that they do like singing ditty girls. That video has like 11 million views now and has an overwhelmingly positive response from his fan base. Now since then, it ended up on some side of Twitter that had a huge, huge, huge problem with it. And when I tell you I have been searching for any kind of like real criticism of this video and I cannot find it, the absolute closest is people saying like, oh, well it's objectifying women, but it's not. It's not. Remember that woman who said that she liked sitting on her porch and drinking coffee and then got absolutely destroyed on Twitter? That's what this is. The only other feedback that I can find is quite simply just that people think it's cringe or too horny. The video very much has like a millennial style of humor to it, especially because it's also like a guy with cat ears. But come to find out through the statement that Joe Cat made, this exploded on Twitter in a way that apparently people did see. It was a while ago, but it has continued and continued and continued to escalate. And he hasn't been addressing it because he doesn't want to feed into it, but he's being doxxed. He's being sent packages, unhinged shit. And in his statement, he basically says, look, if this is what it means to be a content creator is to be be able to do this, then I just don't think I can. So I'm gonna go. He continues to not say anything about who or what as far as the harassment coming toward him, but he has over a million subscribers. This is a significant source of money, very likely for his family. I believe that it's very bad and that this has created real fear in him and the people he loves. Now, just to be clear, you don't have to like anything. And if something makes you uncomfortable for any reason, you do not have to watch it. But there is a major difference between something making you personally uncomfortable and being objectively problematic. And trying to convince others that it's problematic because you don't like it is fucked up. I'm seeing a lot in the conversation around this, the phrasing around like, well, it's gonna be like that. There are gonna be people that do this and who escalate things and who make things terrible and who sends you tons of hate, who dox you. Can we stop saying that? I know that not saying it won't make it not happen, but but we're treating it like the internet, as though the internet isn't people, the internet isn't us. By saying things like, yeah, it's gonna happen, it's just what it is, da da da, it's the internet, we're creating a permissive culture for this type of thing. Just like how harmful purity culture is. The series of functionally harmless actions which create an environment that is permissive of harm. While trying to find actual, like, real reasons why people dislike this video so much because it is hard to find. I did continue to find people being, like, shitty and hateful toward him, although very much, again, it's, mm, this is a you problem. The one thing I did find that had, like, a little bit more to it were people saying that this is karma for him because of the way he acted in another situation, which happened earlier. Because when Hogwarts Legacy came out, there were creators who were playing the game, making content around it, and they were receiving harassment, and I believe in some instances being doxxed. And there's a screenshot of tweets from Joe Cat, which seemed to be in response to someone else complaining about people who played Hogwarts Legacy getting harassment, and him saying, you're using this to take the topic of conversation away from the actual harm being done to trans folks. Assumedly related to the fact that even though J.K. Rowling didn't work on Hogwarts Legacy directly, she still owns the IP. She makes millions every year in royalties. So you are, yes, supporting her and her views by supporting that game. However, this was seen by some as to be permissive of the doxing that was happening to others. So now those same people are like, well, you got it now. And I will say personally, I do believe I understand what he's saying and I don't read it at all as it's okay to dox or harass people. And even since he's made his announcement that he's leaving, he's made several follow-up tweets specifically saying not to harass people and he didn't name anybody. Anyway, here's what you can do. Joe Cat's YouTube channel will continue to be monetized for at least six months after his last upload. So at least through May. 
the absolute nicest material thing we can do for him right now is watch the shit out of all of his stuff. If you like Joe Cat and you remember watching his stuff and having a great time, go do it now. And if you haven't yet, please, please go check him out. If you enjoy this series, I think you will very much enjoy him. I'm putting up playlists on his channel. Please, please go check them out. The more you watch, the more money he'll be able to make before he loses that monetization. People have been sending him tons of positivity and I'm sure he appreciates that, but reminder that we do also need to eat and this is a significant significant portion of his household's income that is going to be lost. It's win-win, go do it. Hello and welcome back to episode 19 of Niche Chi, where we talk about drama happening in communities you may not be a part of. Last time we talked about the really sad situation in the animation community where creator Joe Cat was functionally run off the internet. Today we're going to move over to what is known as Goral World to talk about the recent situation that happened between YouTube creator Chantal, aka Foodie Beauty, and her husband Salah. As always, first up, what is Goral World? Girl world is a term, it's so hard to say. It refers to a community of both creators and critics of those creators. The community started around creators who had initially started channels or started making content around some sort of weight loss journey. And that's sort of still there, I guess, for some of them, some of the time, but like they themselves are basically just like, what if the real world were made of like random people? They're just drama generators at this point. They make money by getting very emotional, being very reactionary, reacting to each other and getting fights in each other. And then there are people that criticize them. They'll fight with them and they'll fight with each other. And it's just become this self-perpetuating cycle of messiness. If you wanna know more about Goro World in general, I'm gonna point you to a mutual of mine named Mika SF on YouTube. She has a playlist where she specifically goes through kind of all of it from different angles and different stuff that's happened. Her channel in general, I would highly recommend. She has a degree in like rhetoric analysis basically and she talks about a lot of social and YouTube stuff from that perspective it's very very interesting before we go any further I want to be very very clear and specific here nothing we are about to talk about nothing about this specific situation has anything to do with the shape of or changing shape of anyone's flesh prison this is also not your opportunity to be taking out any built-up resentment over the fact that some girl who weighed more than you in high school stole your boyfriend or rejected you I will be looking at comments I will be deleting I will be blocking keep your shit in line the creator we'll be specifically talking about today is named Foodie Beauty, aka Chantal. She is a member of Goral World. So again, just very messy, very emotional on live all the time, posting several times a day or at least every day. It's that same type of thing. Very much drama generation. She is also like not a good person. She lies constantly, including about really important things like criminal allegations, I've seen allegations that she's been very racist and bigoted been, we'll say, not nice to animals. You get the point. Her life is set up almost like seasons of a show. They call them arcs. Usually these arcs are related to her being in a relationship with a particular person. Currently she is in what is called the Kuwait arc because she married a man named Salah and converted to Islam and moved with him to Kuwait. There's of course all kinds of drama around this all the time related to like whether or not she's actually Islam and whether this relationship is real. Is he clout chasing? She has had problems with that in the past. So what happened? This time, one or two weeks ago, screenshots came out from a woman who claimed that she was having very inappropriate conversations with Chantal's husband, Salah. Immediately, these were confirmed to be true. Now that sucks, a thousand percent, fuck that guy. But I wouldn't normally consider talking about this just by itself. However, turns out the girl that he cheated with was a member of Chantal's fan base. Oh. <laughs> AKA a beezer, which is just like a term she made up for her followers. And she was one who had a little bit of clout, which is why people think Salah was interested. You can see in screenshots between them that he was kind of like, I'm not gonna say anything because you're a big creator and I'm a big creator. Like he thought he could get away with it because of this. So that's rough. But also the screenshots that the girl, her name's Kay Bella, has been putting all over Twitter. God, she planned this are so wild. Now look, I am not here to kink shame. Do what you like. I'm gonna put some of these up here without comment. Trigger warning for everything. This is me not commenting. I have nothing to say. You can pause to read. I'm censoring these as best I can. So good luck, but they're pretty rough. Go to Twitter for more. Now, when these came out, Chantal immediately went on live because that's what she does. She happened to be back in Canada at the time when she did that. So she went live in her car and she sounded honestly 
pretty devastated. I felt really bad for her because I don't know better because I'm not in the community. <laughs> he was like texting her during the live and like saying all these mean things to her. I'm gonna put up here a good video that has like all the screenshots and then that initial live so you can see what I'm talking about if you wanna see it all. She even says in the beginning of the live that the Kuwait arc is over, like she, <laughs> She knows what she's doing to an extent, but I did think she was devastated. She sounded really sad. Um, she was fighting with Salah. She was saying it was over and she was leaving him and that she wasn't gonna fall for this again because this sort of thing I think has happened again with another guy that she had dated where he strung her along and he, I guess, was cheating on her. And she talks about how the girl who did this did this presumably to try and get back into the good graces of another Goral World creator named FFG, literally was kicked out of a live because FFG was already annoyed at K-Bella for supporting Chantal in the past. And this community is insane. So Chantal is like, ride the clout, you know, that's all you're trying to do this for, which it does seem like it is. Like she is on Twitter and it's funny, don't get me wrong. It's real funny, but like, why? Why do this? She claims that she's doing it because she found out what a horrible person Chantal is, re all the stuff I mentioned before and more probably. Which sure, but like this seems a little far. Not to put the blame on her, Salah is a whole ass man. He can make his own choices. And he made bad ones. But then of course, as I should have seen coming, a couple of days later, Chantal put up a video and I think then even another video literally saying, I don't give a fuck. Where she says how she now knows everything and she's seen everything and that he's just really repressed because he was brought up in a really restrictive religious environment. And so he hasn't had the ability to like express these kinks that he has. And obviously he doesn't value her. He values Chantal as his wife. And so that's why he said all these like disgusting disgusting things to Kay Bella and how she's choosing to forgive him that it's her decision in her marriage, which it is, but also very much trying to give Salah every excuse imaginable and putting it entirely on Kay Bella, which like, come on. People had a lot of feelings about that, obviously. Again, this is very much par for the course. I don't think people should be surprised. Makes emotional decisions, lies, then comes back on them and then tells everyone to go away. And she does this constantly. However, that video that she posted saying she doesn't care has already come down. So I don't know what that means. I'll be real. People are having a field day with this. It's been an exciting couple of weeks in Goral world. You truly will find just hours and hours of content relating to all these various people. Amberlynn Reed is another really big one in the community. So if you want that type of messiness, it's everyday people drama, but it's just so crazy. But if that's your jam, enjoy. There's an absolute black hole of content for you there. Hello and welcome back to Niche Tea, where we talk about drama happening in communities you may not be a part of. Last time we talked about the latest event in the never-ending saga that is Gore World, specifically how Foodie Booty's husband Salah was cheating on her with a fan. Today we're diving into what I would guess to be the largest community we've discussed to date, but I still consider it to be niche because for me, niche is about the specificity of the topic more than the size of the community. And I'm honestly shocked it took us 20 episodes to get here. We're talking about BTS Army versus Tidal Wave Comics. So who are we talking about? BTS is... Are you new here? BTS, a South Korean boy band. You could call them popular. The members aren't directly involved in this, so I'm not gonna talk about them too much. What I am gonna talk about are BTS Army. ARMY is the official fandom name for BTS. Almost every K-pop group has an official fandom name. It's usually a big deal when it's announced. And traditionally, ages ago, being in the fandom meant that you literally applied and it was like a club that you joined. And being part of that club, you had to act in certain ways. You were expected to do certain things. You had specific rules you had to abide by, but you were also more likely to be able to, for example, get into the music shows when they were performing. It's a very interesting dynamic in South Korea when it comes to like the very official nature of some fan clubs. Since K-pop has gotten a lot bigger and a lot of these have gone international, I would say outside of South Korea, it is less intense of a meaning. In the US, it's predominantly used as a way to just signify you really like them more than just as a casual listener. For example, I like BTS, I would not consider myself an ARMY. I would potentially say that I'm a blackjack and a VIP and a hitting card. You get it. Now, these fandoms skew very young and they're all very passionate. The same way Swifties are passionate, the same way the Beehive is passionate, so is ARMY. But a little bit more so because they do, again, skew younger than those groups. The most this usually ever amounts to though is online conversation and potentially not great concert etiquette. On the other side, we have Tidal Wave Comics, which is a comic book production studio. They have a number of different series, but specifically today, we're gonna be talking about a new issue of their Fame series, which is a series of unauthorized biographies. 
Last week, Tidal Wave Comics announced that they would be releasing the first ever biographical comic book for BTS called Fame BTS on January 10th, which is today as I'm filming this. Now again, this isn't the first one that they've put out in this series, however, it is the first K-pop one. And I don't think they did a lot of research into whether or not this sort of thing would be appreciated by BTS fans. Because almost immediately there was a lot of pushback. The immediate reaction was ARMY's calling out that as an unauthorized product, this is something that won't benefit BTS in any way for them to buy, since none of the profits go back to BTS or their agency in any way. So from ARMY's perspective, Tidal Wave is taking advantage of their love of BTS in a way that won't in any way benefit the actual boys themselves. Made worse by the fact that the group is on hiatus while they finish up their military service. Because it's like Tidal Wave is like, oh, let's strike while the iron's hot and they can't get anything from the actual guys, so they'll be more likely to buy this, I guess. Then on top of that, it doesn't look that great. I haven't bought it, but I've seen a few panels and there's definitely been a lot of clowning on the art and the writing. There's a panel I saw that was saying that like fans were excited they were in the military because they could make different and better fanfics about them. One panel actually has their name spelled wrong and that that's embarrassing. So all to say, ARMY has been expressing their displeasure at this, both at Tidal Wave Comics directly, as well as at the writer of this specific BTS comic, a man named Eric Esquivel. What makes this interesting is the back and forth that has spawned out of this, mostly with Eric. Tidal Wave has pretty much responded the way I would have expected. They put out a statement saying that, yes, this is an honor authorized biography, but that's legal and they're allowed to do that. They mentioned that fandoms usually appreciate these when they make them about their favorite artists, but again, this kind of just speaks to the fact that they didn't really do enough research on K-pop as a genre, given that they're trying to sell this to fans. And then they have a statement saying that they'll report harassment, but other than that, they're continuing to promote the book. Eric however, has been on Twitter just talking absolute trash. He seems to be thinking this is a really fun time to try and like dunk on what he considers to be or is trying to paint as the crazy BTS fans. He keeps saying this is like for normal BTS fans and that the regular ones are great and that the people giving him criticisms are all too obsessive and cult-like. It's a weird move, honestly, and I say that as somebody who works in marketing. Again, these are the people that you're selling this to. And by responding to them this way, you are just creating more content for them and people like me to start talking about. Yeah, you're going to get more marketing and attention on the book, which I assume is what his goal is here. What do you think casual BTS fans are gonna think of you and supporting your product when they see how you are treating the fandom? Especially with the criticism of the art and writing that already exists for the book. Like if it was really, really good, then maybe, but like it doesn't seem like it is best and if there's one thing to know about ARMY, they do not play. Since this all started, they've been actively encouraging the rest of the fandom to not buy this book and anybody who likes BTS to not buy this book. They're flooding it with negative reviews in any place that they can, which is mostly the Barnes & Noble website it looks like right now. In response to this, Eric continued to double down and basically said, thank you for your review bombing because it's actually pushing out the book to more people on the Barnes & Noble website. It doesn't matter that it's negative engagement, it's just engagement. So we're actually selling more. Both he and Tidal Wave Comics also posted screenshots showing that the book was a number one Amazon bestseller before it was even released. And in this case, it was like teen biographies about musicians, the way it was number one. Outside of that, I think of all biographies, I saw it at number 18, only of the new releases, not of all books, just new releases. And outside of that, it's not ranking at all in the top 100 on any other list that I can find. There's no way to know at this point other than them telling us how much it's actually sold. However, on top of that, ARMY have also now started to pull back up some essay allegations that were levied against Eric a number of years back, which actually led to the cancellation of a DC comic that he was working on at the time called Border Town. To be clear, I do not see any evidence that Eric was ever arrested, let alone convicted for anything related to these allegations. However, his collaborators on Border Town did drop from the project specifically because of these allegations and because of not wanting to further associate with him. And that is what led to the comic being discontinued by DC. Now, again, these are allegations only. It's never gone any further than that. However, his responses to this being brought up were really distasteful, in my opinion. In one tweet specifically, he like low-key shits on his previous collaborators for Border Town because they didn't stand by him. Like what? Just really left a bad taste in my mouth, to be honest. So yeah, it seems like he's doing this just to be mean-spirited, but also to drum up more controversy to hopefully get more press and organic growth for the book itself and hopefully drive more sales. I don't know how well that's going to work. I guess we shall see. 
He's kind of hoping that there will be enough of a reaction from other more casual fans of saying, well, I want to separate myself from these crazy fans that I'll go ahead and support this guy. And I don't know that that's going to happen, to be frank with you. Good luck.